He is a Denver native born of Denver natives. A former Denver chief deputy district attorney. He is now an active Colorado trial lawyer. Bright, independent, and full of fun, he has been part of the media for decades. This is The Craig Silverman Show. Oh, 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 what a world, what a life, what a day. Oh my gosh, what a night. June 9th is the night, the show June 10. I just watched game four, and the grit of this Denver Nuggets team is like nothing I've ever seen. It's not just the Joker and Jamal Murray, Bruce Brown, Mr. Nugget, Aaron Gordon. Holy cow. We talk a lot of nuggets today with Connor McCormick Cavanaugh. What a great guest. He was a great writer for Westward. Maybe he still is. He contributed a scoop about Rocky. You know, the mountain lion that used to be the best thing to see down at McNichols and then the Pepsi Center and then the Ball Center. I am hoarse from watching this game. For a while there, I thought Scott Foster was going to screw us, but he just couldn't ruin what has turned out to be one of the best weeks of my life. Seriously, I've been a Nuggets fan forever. Please read my Colorado Sun column. I put a lot of heart and soul into it. Talked about my old pal, Hyman Goldberg, the greatest clutch shooting I've ever seen at a pro basketball game, and I've seen quite a few Thanks to my dad. You know, I was going to start that column with, Dear Dad, I wish you were here for this and to pay for the tickets. Am I going to reach into my pocket for game five ticket money? I don't know. But I do know I'm going to the parade, and that's probably going to be on Tuesday or Wednesday. And Tuesday, that's the day Donald Trump has to turn himself in, in Miami. Denver Nuggets, greatest games in Miami. Remember when then Morris' brother got into it with Jokic and he bashed the guy in the back and then the Morris' brother was waiting for him in Miami and my son was going to the University of Miami. I was going to go to that game, but the Morris' brother, I think he chickened down, and I know the Nuggets won down there. They never lose in Miami. And I hope Jack Smith never loses in Miami. We've got a bad rep, bad judge. We know that about Eileen Cannon. I think Jack Smith knew the case would be assigned to her. The way it always worked in Denver District Court is this. If you've handled the litigants before, the case comes to you. That way they can't keep filing different lawsuits, searching for a judge. The first assignment is supposed to be random. So when they did that search warrant in Mar-a-Lago, it went to Judge Eileen Cannon, who is a loose cannon, a Maggie Cannon. She was appointed by Donald J. Trump, ruled in his favor at first till she got slapped down by the 11th Circuit. Boy, is our rule of law under test. But I think we have this covered. I get into it with Connor. Let me tell you about Connor. He covered sports. He loves sports. He's a New York guy, but he fell in love with Denver during his five years here as a Westward reporter. Covered sports. He has a scoop about Rocky. Yes, the original Rocky is back in that costume. He'll be there Monday night. That's another reason to go see Ken Solomon. Wow. Listen to the discussion, and maybe you will pay top dollar like I might have to. This is Denver history. And it's American history, and America may be history if Donald Trump somehow survives. I don't know. It would be much more profound than the heat coming back. There are 37 charges. I read that indictment. They have him cold, okay? And their only defense is, hey, Hillary did it too. Are you kidding me? That's not a defense. That's a confession. It did what? It's not the same. Nobody defied subpoenas like you did. 
Nobody did the run around and trick their own lawyer. What kind of guy is Donald Trump? Well, it's going to be exposed in New York City. And that's times two between Alvin Bragg and Tish James. Tish James is going to pull his pants down in the civil courts, make it hurt. And now we've got Jack Smith doing his thing in Miami. You know what? If you're a good team, you can win in Miami, even with a bad judge or a bad ref. Jokic should not have had five fouls, but look what the Nuggets proved anyway. And Jack Smith can prove that anyway. And you know what? This is just a test case because the case that Donald J. Trump needs to get charged with is January 6th, where he was the ringleader. And Jack Smith knows that. Jack Smith's going to prove that. That case will be brought in D.C. someday after Pawnee Willis brings her case in Atlanta, or I don't know, simultaneous, around the same time this summer. Four cases. And if the Republicans want to back this guy against those odds and say he's being picked on, it's a hoax, it's a, it's a witch hunt, well, then we are just gone as country, but we aren't. We are not gone. The Nuggets are on the edge of their first NBA title. I have a great show coming up because we are talking about the Nuggets. Gosh, that was a great game. Game three and game four. Game three was the biggest win in Nuggets history until game four. And that will be true until game five because if the Nuggets win in Denver Monday night, that will be the biggest Nuggets win in history. And the Heat are no slouches, but we've got the horses. I'm not talking Dan Essel. He was a great Nugget, but nothing like Nicola. Nicola! Oh, I just think he's great. He's so excited. We're so excited. He sprained his ankle. Guess what? If you play a lot of basketball, you sprain your ankle. That's just part of being a hoopster. And my God, this guy could be the greatest hoopster ever. I talked about it with Bill Walton last week. This week, Connor. Connor McCormick Kavanaugh. He knows hoop. He loves hoop. He loves the Knicks. He loves Carmelo Anthony. We get into all of that. And after the basketball talk, we talk about the mayoral election. He covered it until he had to move because his wife's a medical student. I think he'll be back. And I told him so. Our troubadour is back every week. And right after the break, you'll hear from him. And we talk about the indictment. And I want you to hear his incredible song, Train keeps coming. And my God, the Nuggets are playing with force like a locomotive. And I hope we don't hit the wall. Can you imagine losing this 3-1 lead? Let's not even talk about that. Let's talk about a different train, the Trump train, coming to a sudden stop. Please read those 49 pages. They're fun and exciting. And I discussed them with the troubadour and we play his song when we come back, a special NBA Finals edition, edition 152, featuring Connor McCormick, Kavanaugh. Thanks for listening. Tell a friend, please subscribe. Five stars is nice. Enjoy. It's hot in here. Did that toaster catch on fire? It wasn't that. You choked on that bite of burnt bagel. Why is everything all red? The heat is unbearable. Where am I? Excuse me, your dishonor. May I step in on behalf of my client? Mr. Silverman, proceed. Tell me one redeeming good thing your client did. He was a faithful listener to my radio show. Not good enough. He had decency and compassion for his family. He did end-of-life planning with Michael Bailey. The Michael Bailey? That is kind to your loved ones. That is smart and way too decent for this place. Your client can go. And what about me, your despicableness? Why should I? Michael Bailey is my lawyer, too. Go on, then. Get out of here. <laughs> now, part of that was serious, and part of that was fictional. But you will die someday, and if you don't make a legal plan, the government will make one for you. Call my lawyer, Michael Bailey. His rates are reasonable, and he can meet with you and your spouse wherever you want, and on weekends and evenings. 720-394-6887 or online at MB Law. LLC.com. Now back to the Fred Silverman Show. Hey, 
it being a lawyer is a matter of judgment. You have to know the law, the facts, but good judgment is essential. If you don't understand how Donald Trump is culpable for the crimes committed in his name, then I question your judgment. I have the good judgment to question Donald Trump. If you want a lawyer like that, instead of a knucklehead who believes in the MAGA propaganda, call Craig. 303-734-7156. 303-734-7156. I am Craig. Craig Silverman. A voice for victims. Troubadour. Hi, Craig. You know what this is? Game three. Game, game four. four. But I, it's actually going to be game five. Because the intro at the start of the podcast will be me after the game. Because we like to stay current, up to date. Connor McCormick, Kavanaugh helps me analyze game three, which was the best nugget victory ever. And I've watched them all. It was exciting. But do you understand what I'm saying? The best nugget win ever so far. Well, I think I understand, but I have to admit to being, you know, a Johnny come lately as far as basketball fans go. Come on. Two triple doubles with guys scoring in the 30s. It's never happened in NBA history. As I told you on our walk, it's just never been done in a regular season game, let alone a playoff game or the NBA finals where we are for the first time. But I'm overstimulated because... This has the potential of being the greatest week in modern history if the Nuggets can keep it going. Uh, I'm excited to watch tonight. Do you know why? Well, keep going. Because Jack Smith has pulled down Donald Trump's pants. The indictment has been released. It's 49 pages. And do you see what I have on? Your glasses. I put on my reading glasses. Yes. I said it the delectable egg. Read it on my phone. It's easy to read. The indictment? Yes. The full, the complete indictment? The complete. I can tell you everything in the world about it. And the most famous new first name that I never heard before, but he's the guy who will sink the Trump train or derail the Trump train. What's his name? Have you ever heard the name Saltine, like the cracker? No. Well, it's not Saltine. S-O-L? No, it's not Saltine. It's Waltine. Okay. W A L T I N E. Waltine. Is that the first name? That's the guy. Yeah. First name. That's that's the that's the body man for Donald Trump. He is also getting charged. He's the worker. His last name is Nauta. N A U T A. Waltine Nauta. And he was in the Navy, he grew up in Guam. Then he got in the Navy. Then he got into the kitchen at the White House. Then people liked him, and he moved his way up the ranks until Trump said, hey, do you want to go with me to Mar-a-Lago? And he did. He quit the service, worked for Trump, did everything. Now, Trump is hard to catch because he never emails or he never texts messages, but Waltine did. And <laughs> Waltine got caught in some lies, and he's got text messages with pictures as Trump, with him, hid the records. You know who they hid them from? Um, Who would they have hid them from? I mean, they didn't know the FBI was coming. The government. Right. But they hid them from his own lawyer. Oh, really? Yes, and Mm. said, because the lawyer was hired, you come down, you got to certify that you've searched. Okay, And then before the search was done, he moved the critical boxes into his own room. And then he stayed. They were supposed to go to Bedminster because he doesn't like to spend June. This was last June. He doesn't like to spend that in Florida because he's rich, you know. So he's going to get up to different climes. Gets too hot in Florida. But he was there that day when he had his lawyer come by. And he made sure he searched, and he said, oh, did you find anything? And then they talked. But meanwhile, it was a fraud on the lawyer, who's now quit. Two more lawyers have quit. Donald Trump uses lawyers like toilet paper. It's unbelievable. 
So this guy, Waltine, so he came clean with all this stuff. Yeah, he had to. And he was caught on film and stuff. He said, yeah, I helped move the boxes. He does the grunt work with the other people. He's the body guy, but he's not afraid to get his hands dirty, sort of like you. You know, I see you in your yard. That's Waltine. He's a worker, and when guys needed help moving the boxes in some direction, he helped them move the boxes. But Trump sorted through them. And then Trump got interviewed by, this is sweet, by Mark Meadows' biographer, and he starts waving around classified documents saying, look, this is what the general gave me to attack Iran. And uh, here, read this part. And then he says, you know... This is off the record because this is classified, and I didn't declassify it the way I need to declassify it, so we got to keep this secret. Yeah, right. He's just talking to random people. Now, I think it's more than that, but in fairness to Trump, he's facing over 100 years for what he did. I think he kept them to use his leverage and for money, but they don't have to prove that, and that's not part of the allegations right now. I think it's tied up in this live golf stuff, the Saudis, all of that. Jared Kushner got $2 billion. What did they get in exchange? How the Pentagon looks to attack Iran? That would be worth a lot of money. And then you're you're in bed with the devil. And MBS is connected to Putin. And you know what I think about that. But I think this guy, Jack Smith, he gave a two-minute statement, Troubadour, And he made a great first impression on me. I said, that's a prosecutor. He said, no. Short and uh, sweet. Short and sweet. Mm -hmm. And he looked tough, Mm -hmm. like a guy who could fight in Ukraine right now on the right side, on the right side. So you can tell I'm a little jacked up because, I mean, when he got indicted yesterday, that was a great day after the day before when the Nuggets had that epic game three. And now to read the indictment and realize that they have them not just on the crimes, but the obstruction. And any lawyer who supports this guy, and dang, I heard Dan Kaplis, and his defense, you know what it is? No. What about Hillary? Oh, right. And it's going to tear the country apart. And why are they doing this? Because these are national secrets, nuclear secrets. Holy cow. But even Dan had to say, well, I don't know. He wants to work for Trump. Honestly, he would be hired by him. And if he wins, God forbid, he'd be like a press secretary. He acknowledges that. It frightens me to know such people. But good people are just distancing themselves from Trump. You know who that includes? Although he's done it before. But he's a stalwart Republican. Uh, Jack uh, Jack, uh, Christie? Oh, yeah. Chris Christie. I haven't heard from him yet. But Mitt Romney issued an eloquent statement. Asa Hutchinson's on him. Chris Christie will be on him. There's a time for choosing for Republicans. But Mm -hmm. this guy laid out the facts. And you know what he said in that two-minute speech, Jack Smith? I'd like to hear that. We're going to insert it right here. But the highlight was, read the indictment. It's a speaking indictment. It's 49 pages. It goes fast. It's double-spaced. Dan Kaplis was complaining, oh, it sounds like the Dems wrote it because it's so effective. No, it was written by a prosecutor. And these Republicans should be on the side of law and order. So, and, Greg, question yes, on this. Yes. Oh, it got assigned to a terrible judge, that Trump judge who already ruled for him. But I think it had to go that way. They had to file in Florida because all the crimes are in Mar-a-Lago where he hangs out with that Jew hater, Nick Fuentes and Kanye West. How about that Thanksgiving dinner? I love this happening in Mar-a-Lago. Okay, so Jack Kemp, in term, I guess my question is, how much does intent come into play? None, none on this crime. But he's he, it's like Hamilton. He ain't going to be president now because he wrote everything down here. It's all recorded. They quote him, and he's he's like Rush Limbaugh. You can hear the papers rustling. And he's using it for laugh lines. It's General Milley. Look, General Milley tries to make me the bad guy. But look, here's a report from him. I'd like to show you more here. Look over my shoulder. See what he wants to attack? Ha, ha, ha. And they put laughter in the transcript. 
Wow. So he's such a doofus. And there right, was- but that I guess that's what I'm wondering is if he'll just if his lawyers would just paint him as a kind of a kind of a bumble a bumbler, you know. But these are, these are nuclear secrets. If you let him go on this, and he acknowledges that they weren't declassified. There's a process, and he used it before. So even if you say, hey, well, he didn't know. He knew. He said he knew. They got him cold. They really do. And it does carry over 100 years. You can't mishandle stuff. David Petraeus got in trouble for this, remember? Yeah. He yeah. took a couple files to give to his uh, somebody he was having sex with who was writing a book right. about him. Yep. And he, he had to plead to a misdemeanor, but so how but does the this... thing is the thing is that Trump was warned over and over, right. hey, come clean, come clean, come clean. And he kept doing stuff that they now know to obstruct. So how does this play for Biden, who did some of the same? Well, Biden did none of the same. Well, He's like he, a goofy old man. Took... It's like I've got all my law files. Did I take something? I don't know, in all my boxes. I don't think so. They're going to play that card. No, but but that is inadvertent. And if you discover it, you turn it over. And you don't hide boxes. When they mm, said, right. hey, you've got stuff maybe in your Philadelphia office, in your Delaware home, etc." He said, be my guest. Have a search. Trump said, be my guest. Have a search. But he hid it. He, he hid it first from his lawyer who certified it. And he's he's still hiding it. And there's stuff like this document, the attack Iran plans, it's never been recovered. Some people think it's buried with Ivana in Bedminster because that's where he had that conversation. And she's buried off the first tee. I mean, can you imagine if you had a country club, I mean, would your first wife, would she want to be buried off your first tee? I don't think so. I I can't Even if you have a good relation, you know, but... It's so you know the other odd thing. Tell me, and maybe you can write a song about it. By the way, your song this week is perfect. How is this all happening in Miami? Jack Smith, Donald Trump has to show up three o'clock on Tuesday to turn himself in in Miami. Denver's winning the NBA Finals in Miami. It's a hostile court, just like Jack Smith's going to face. But if you are so dominant, it doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? It certainly seemed that way uh, two nights ago. Right. Yeah. And after reading that indictment, any jury will get this. And the judge has bosses. It's like a ref that's against you, Scott Foster. They have bosses. They can't go too far. Another question. Yes. They find him guilty. Yes. Will it... Is a... Will a sentence, a jail sentence, be mandatory? Will he go to jail? Yes. So they couldn't recommend for... Well, um, you, can, you, you can always... Fudge certain, so, yeah, you, the, know, you can. You can always... The... By agreement, you can do those sorts of things. But, you know, you want to you wanna say nobody's above the law. That's another thing that uh, Jack Smith said. In other words, no one's above the law. It, no one's below the right, law. But when so you talk I, about 100 years... He he doesn't need 100 years. There are 37 counts. They can run concurrent. And I think one of these charges may carry, uh, some carry big penalties. And he's in trouble like he's never experienced. But the, the truth is, it won't go to trial before the election. And within another couple months, we're going to be talking about Atlanta. And then we're going to be talking about D.C. for January 6th, the return of Jack Smith. So this is- while it's going to be four criminal cases pending against him. If you were betting this at DraftKings, anybody beating all these charges, what is it, a couple hundred charges? I'd say it'd be about 20 million to one. You know what I would recommend for sentencing? What? Community service. You're like Geraldo, my but, old buddy. And but I no, want no, no, you but to you stay. Heard, you know what Geraldo is saying? You haven't heard about my community yeah, okay. service. Okay. okay. So he has to pick up litter along the side of the highway, right? Like near near Mar-a-Lago, right? Okay. He, he has to be with all the with all the um the other poor, you know, city jail guys uh-huh. who they let out to pick up garbage. Like for a long time. Like for ten years. 
What about that? Yeah, no, I like it. It's got to be a Florida sentence, and there's some causeway. I, I don't really picture Mar-a-Lago. I don't know Palm Beach that well. Although I was talking about it with my old buddy Hyman Goldberg. I wrote about him. God, it was good to reconnect with Hyman Goldberg, who made seven straight to win a car at a Nuggets game. I wrote about it for the Colorado Sun, and I reconnected with him after 50 years. But let me talk about this week. Justice in Miami. I just think it's a strange confluence of events. Who knew, you know, a couple of weeks ago that Miami was going to be a factor in the two biggest stories in my life. Um, I like this prosecutor. Did you see who reemerged this week on Twitter? Of course you didn't. You've never been on Twitter. That's correct. <laughs> Mother Tucker Carlson. Oh, Mother Tucker. And he was saying that the Ukrainians are committing sabotage of their own dam, flooded themselves. It was like Putin broadcasting on his own. And you know what he said about my hero, Zelensky? What did he say? Well, what would you, ex what would you expect an anti-Semite to say, a guy who's been condemned by the ADL? I don't know. About Zelensky? I don't know. He would. He well, would what would be a stereotype of a Jew? Oh. Well, let's see. What kind of what kind of creature? I don't even. I don't even All want right, to here go it there. is. They called them sweaty, and I liked it. That Jack Smith had a little flop sweat on the top of his high forehead, like I do all the time. Anyway, sweaty, and we don't like it being called that because I am sweaty, and it heads too close to him. And then he called them rat-like. Holy cow, I went up on my radio show because that's what Trump called Michael Cohen. Called him a rat. And that's what, in the scene from Inglorious Bastards, that's what the Jew hunter calls the Jew. They are the rats. While the Jews are hiding underneath the floorboards. And that's Tucker Carlson calling Zelensky sweaty and rat-like. What a scumbag that guy is. And platformed by Elon Musk. And in what way is he rat-like? I mean, that's that's a terrible thing to say Jewish. about someone like... I guess because well, he's Jewish? You're, well, you're postulating that. No, I you know who else they're going to aim their anger at? And they already are? Jack Smith's top guy. You know what his name is? He's a Jewish guy. I know that because they researched him and he went to Brandeis before he went to Harvard Law. Not a lot of Gentiles go to Brandeis, but you know what his name is? Cohen. Brat. Brat. B, no, B-R-A-T-T. J. Brat. Okay. He's the head of counterintelligence, but he's left that position in DOJ to help Jack Smith because there is counterintelligence aspects to this. I'm just saying he's a Jewish guy, and I expect him to be attacked accordingly. And it's not hard to call J. Brat a rat, which is what they're going to do. And they say Jay Brat was threatening people. If you don't testify a certain way, you know your lawyer is being considered for a judgeship. They're starting on him. And uh, I can identify these things. But your music keeps improving. I don't know how you do it. This, this is really the highlight of 152, and this part of my great week, is new music from you. Yes, I uh, I sent you an MP3 of the new CD. Right, it's all done. No, yeah. you only sent me one song. I did. I figured let's try one. I just kind of put my toe in the water. It's kind of my new favorite. Oh, great! And it's apropos of today because the train keeps coming. Well, and you you gain momentum. You got who is it? Johnny Neal on the fiddle. Johnny Neal plays fiddle. And, and aren't you going for the sound of a train picking yeah, up speed? That's right. Yeah, yeah. James Townsend, uh, who drums for uh, Papa Mo and the Vipers, my band, um, he is the one laying down that nice train beat throughout. Right. You get a momentum. That's going to work on the dance floor. I hope so. But you know what's going to throw them off? The end. <laughs> the sudden ending. Yeah. It's like a crash. Well... What's that's, the metaphor there? That's how endings can be. Is the train like life? It gets faster and faster. And, and then it kind of just ends. 
I don't know. Craig, it's up to you to. Well, you it's wrote it. It's yeah, not like Rabbi Swarn's joke. No, but I had joke. nothing in mind like that with the ending. You remember no. Rabbi Swarn's joke? It's not mine. He said at one of his birthdays, he said, as you get older, life is like a roll of toilet paper. Right. Right. It just rolls faster and faster. It, yes. <laughs> yeah, I had out some of that. that. Right. All right. We're well, out it's of a it. song about mortality. I, I mean, know, but know. back to the train. I yeah. feel the nuggets regain momentum. I feel like they're a train, but I was worried there for a minute. And oh my God, they could still lose. Even if they win game four, we could still hit the wall. It's and if the Nuggets don't it. win oh. the finals, this season is just, this it's is a the failure. Season. It's got to, right. Well, it's a failure. let's not even talk about I that. I know, but it's like hitting a wall if somehow Miami comes back. But here's the train I do want to think about hitting a wall. The Trump train. I think they just hit a wall with Jack Smith and Jay Brat and Walt Nada, Waltine Nada, and the attorneys who are turning against him because they had to tell the truth. And the judge said, you can tell everybody what your client told you. You know why? You'd say, and that's what Trump thought. Hey, it's confidential. Right. Right? And but so, you know why it wasn't? Why? Because you can't commit a crime with a lawyer and expect the lawyer to keep quiet. Trump's been doing that for years. I can talk about crimes with a lawyer. No, he can't. And don't friggin' mislead a lawyer. That's why it offends me, honestly. I mean, any lawyer should say, this is bullshit. I go back to the way he misuses lawyers and the rule of law. It's all catching up to him. <laughs> and... And uh, I just hope the American people will read the indictment. And I hope that they come see you play. You, you've got, you're playing a gig every weekend. How do you do it at your age? I do it because I love it. But getting back to these lawyers, I don't feel sorry for the lawyers that work for Trump that are now, that you say are used. No, I don't feel sorry for Let them. Let me ask you a question. No, I don't feel sorry a, for a them. A pointed I, question. I, I, I'm disgusted by the lawyers. A pointed question. Yes. Would you work for Donald Trump? Fuck no. No matter what he paid? Fuck no. Okay, that's what I want to hear. Right. So these guys are somewhat complicit in the whole Trump train. What are you calling the com Trump train? Trump train, yeah. 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 But it's going to starting with Giuliani, right? It's exactly. not like they're just, they're just uh, you know... Ethical but you know lawyer, what? I, I appreciate he has a right to a lawyer. And I had to go through this, you know, prosecuting Frank Rodriguez. I would not represent him either. But thank God somebody does. Right. And this guy will get due process. It's in front of a Trump judge. And again, give us the worst reps for the Nuggets. Give us the worst crowd against us. The Nuggets are still going to win. That's the badass attitude of Jack Smith. Plus, right. I don't think he had any choice because... Once uh, a judge is in, assigned in a courthouse, it stays with it. And she got disciplined last time she handled the case. But it's going to be four cases. And there aren't going to be bad judges every time. And just like the Nuggets aren't going to lose four games, I hope, the government's not going to lose four cases against Trump. America, and you know, Kaplan started this way. He said... This is the most dangerous moment since the Civil War. It's going to set us apart. Yeah, if people like Kaplan don't lead in the right direction, don't say, hey, this guy delivered on abortion, but he just obstructed justice. He just took records. You can't do that. Hey, good Republicans. Hey, everybody listening to me. This is bad. Quit defending him. I'm going to not. You know, he, Hillary did it. Joe Biden did it. My late brother, he's in my column too. I was stupid when I was young. So if I did something wrong, I might say, Billy did it too. Right. Well, that's not a defense. That's, no. a, that's a confession. Yes. Billy did it too is a confession. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Holy cow. Anyway, what inspired this? And what's, did you name your new album? What inspired Train Keeps Coming? So... um as usual, I don't remember really what the inspiration. Well, the the song is a train kind of song, so it started off that way. You know, it has a train feel, 
And so it had to be about a train. Well, to me, to give it some... Why? Because you came up with the music first? Yes. And it felt like a train? Yes. I came up and with the music first. And have you written on a lot like... of trains? Yeah, I've written, I've written on my share of trains and heard them. In, Can I tell you when I distance? last rode a train, just as an aside about the past week, and to brag about our show? When? I rode a train down to Union Station for the Mike Johnston victory celebration. I hung out with Federico Pena. And congratulations to Mike Johnston. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Prior guest on my show. Anyway, I was thinking about trains. And then when I talked to our guest today, Connor McCormick, Kavanaugh, he grew up near Pelham, the taking of Pelham 123 and other subway trains. So there's a train show. And you've written a lot about trains. Well, what is your train? Affinity. Where does that come from? Actually, probably the the most um, the the most impactful train experience I had was taking a train from Chicago to Colorado. Um, my parents put me on that train. I was fourteen years old, and I was coming to to Colorado to go to um, Ashcrofters, which was a mountaineering school, basically a summer camp, but with a lot of um, you know mountaineering skills involved. Camp, you know learning to make a fire and survive and uh, climbing and river rafting, all that kind of stuff. It was a great, great experience. So I remember I was sitting for probably, you know, uh, for probably 500 miles, I was sitting in the dome car. Have you seen the dome no, cars? No, I've never the dome car, that kind dome of cars are, are, I want to. Yeah, it's like a dome. It's like a glass dome that you, you can sit um, in, in this car um, and, and see the scenery. And I was just looking for those Rockies, looking for those Rockies. I remember when they finally, when I finally saw them in the distance, it was really exciting. That's probably, that's probably my, my biggest train experience. And then you took the train back to Chicago. Yes. As I recall, you re-enrolled the next summer, right? To and re-enrolled back. as a junior then counselor. Did you come back on the train again? Um, I, I, I may have flown. I can't remember the second time around. Anyway. I was 15. Yeah, what a great it made a big. Uh, yeah, it was a big impact in my life. But um, anyway, no, no, it was great. You talked about you made an allusion to the Civil War and how Capitalist was saying this is. Yes. The, one thing I just want to say because I just saw it and it was great. The movie Lincoln. It's a good movie to watch now. Um, first of all, you know, juxtaposed against a guy like Trump, right? A guy like Lincoln, and just just who he was, his 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 demeanor, his depth of character, all of that. That is great. But also the vitriol in Congress. I mean, it was it was about the passing of the 13th Amendment, right? And who was Speaker of the House? And that was uh, Stevens? Wait, Schuyler was, Colfax. Oh, that, and there was something about him, Schuyler Colfax. Yes. Right, right. That's right. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a great... Daniel Day-Lewis puts in, I mean, an amazing performance, but it's a great movie to see. Well, that's a great song to hear. Get ready for the sudden stop. You might want to jump off just before. Oh, my gosh, if you're dancing to it, you could be swinging your partner, but it works. Great new song from Dave Gunder's new album, Train Keeps Coming by our troubadour. Enjoy. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Craig. That don't bother me none Climbing on with no protection I left my rope behind, it's wearing thin Heartache, rattle and shake Closer now, I hear the whistle singing Distance pound wheels going round I hear the sound of the bells They keep ringing Drifting across the hills And through the snow I thought I'd be okay If I just lay low But I'm on those tracks and running Cause you never got it made Train keeps coming and the train keeps I don't mind, never been quite in line with the rules. Forever is for fools, so I keep my engines coming. You can cry and you can pray, but that train keeps coming. 
train keeps coming. Like a leaf blown in the sky. So I love to see and take it all in. I feel the sun on my skin while it shines. The time washes over everything. What kind of sad song is this to sing? It's a tune before I'm done in. Train keeps coming. They're calling my name out on my high plane. I hear the coyotes sing. Won't keep the night station inside, and I'm high as anything. Looking at the stars, got my guitar, and I stare into the face of love. Angels come down, and chariots are bound, and neon rising above. And that train keeps coming. That train keeps coming. Michael Bailey, a friend, a lawyer, a sponsor. Tell everybody how you bring peace of mind to their life. So by setting up your estate plan, you know what's going to happen to your stuff when you die. You know where it's going to go, you know who's going to get it. We've got everything in place so we're not running to a court to try to get guardianship and conservatorship as quickly as possible. But then it's an orderly proceeding of things. So, you know, there's already enough chaos with the medical emergency, but the legal part of it and who can make decisions is all outlined. It's all set up. So there's, it's like the the smooth transition of power. That's cool because you can avoid so many problems by having a medical power of attorney and discussing it with a smart guy like Michael Bailey, because who should have have this. It's probably somebody close. Who do you trust most among your children to make that call? These are the hard and good questions that you ask every day, right, Michael? Right. And if you ask them beforehand, when you're not in the middle of a crisis, then when a crisis hits, we're not trying to do crisis management and medical emergency and everything else. We're going, okay, we've got a smooth transition of power here. We've got a smooth who's in charge, and we can have that all flow so that we can focus on the care. There are so many things in life that you can fill out a form and save yourself money, save yourself heartache. Some people die out of nowhere quickly, but more often you get sick, you have medical difficulties, so it all goes together. But your system works, it works beautifully. What is the best way to contact you these days? Best way, uh, you can give me a call. My phone number is 720-394-6887. And again, that's 720-394-6887. Or you can go online to michaelbaileylawllc.com. And there is a an appointment page on my website that you can use. So either way is fine. Thanks, Michael. War on drugs has never been more serious. There are killer substances out there, including fentanyl. If, God forbid, you know somebody or a loved one of yours has been affected by fentanyl, perhaps my law firm could help. Sometimes there's justice in the criminal court system. Other times, civil justice. My number, 303-734-7156. 303-734-7156. Ask for Craig. Craig Silverman, a voice for victims. Craig. Connor. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm uh, floating on a cloud after game three last night. That was incredible. We're going to talk about that, Connor. You know, you and I were supposed to get to know each other. And and before that could happen, you left the Mile High City. We are going to get into that, but I bet you will be back someday. Am I right? I imagine. I think there's a good chance. Well, I'd like to put you through an on-air exit interview. Is that okay? 
Yeah, let's do it. We are doing it right now. First of all, have you ever done a podcast before? Yeah, I've done a couple. Um, I mostly did them with CityCast Denver. But have you done one with a lawyer and an attorney? <laughs> have you? I don't think so. Have you ever had to take an oath? I ever had to take an I'm oath. just kidding so. about all that. You don't need to hear it. You can bullshit, but I'll see right through it. And so will my <laughs> audience, okay? Did you pick up any bad habits while you were in Denver and Colorado? Um, I'm thinking about guess, sports wagering, maybe? Uh, yeah, but I'm, I, I have like a healthy skepticism of sports wagering because I, I wrote so much about it. I saw how the industry can be... Um, somewhat predatory and um, kind of manipulative. And I always kind of kept that in the back of my mind. Um, I, Whenever I was doing sports wagering, and I still do occasionally, like I have a small bet on the Nuggets to win the championship, I, uh, I do really small wagers. And um, if I catch myself, you know, making more wagers than I'd like to over a short period of time, over a couple of days, then I'll take a, a break. I'll do semi-retirement from sports betting, and then when I feel okay again about it, um, then I'll start doing it again. But yeah, I think it's an industry that needs um, a lot of oversight, and if it's just well, I've had that I'll- show. I've had Alec Garnett on, who designed it all, and I like it, and I think I can control it, but damn, I was pressing up my bad son Murray and the Joker last night, because I saw Coach Malone's strategy. Did you in the first quarter? Do you know what it was? Uh, no, tell me. It was as simple as on the playground if you really want to win. Instead of making all the kids feel included or whatever, you say, Nicola, you're our best player. Jamal, you're our second best. Everybody else, get out of the way. Give them the ball. They are going to win the game. And they did. Yeah, no, that's tried and true. It's worked uh, Jack and Kobe. It worked with um, LeBron and Dwayne Wade. Like, it's LeBron and Kyrie. It, it, it just works. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. But back to your exit interview. Didn't you fall into the bad habit of Twitter? Twitter's a bad habit, but it's well, When did you start being a presence on Twitter? Because I follow you. You are clever, you are sports-oriented, and you covered city politics. We are going to get to that. But it's all nuggets uh, as the lead story today. And uh, my show is going to be talking about Game 4, but I'm interviewing you before because we are Saturday morning. Before we talk about Twitter, let's not leave the nuggets. What's your level of confidence now? If this is airing on Saturday... Then yes. the Nuggets, the Nuggets won last night, is what I'll say. The Nuggets won on Friday night. And did MPJ come out of his funk? That's a great question. I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no. KCP plays well, yes. um, and then you have that kind of continued uh, great cameo performance by Christian Brown, and. Bruce Brown plays well, um, but no, MPJ, MPJ is just, just not going to show up for these finals. Hmm. Did you, you know, did you watch inside the NBA afterwards? Cause here's another observation I had and they paid Kenny Smith a lot of money to do that show. And before that it was Shaq and Charles Barkley, Barkley always complaining. I got to stay up so late. I got to keep working. Man, you're at the NBA Finals. They're paying you a boatload. Quit complaining. Anyway, Kenny Smith was kind of mailing it in. What a great team the Nuggets are. And they never get on each other. And I don't know if you saw it, but he he had the raised hands thing, you know, where you're doing that to a teammate. And he said that never happens on the Nuggets. And I thought back, it happened tonight when MPJ didn't cover his zone. I mean... The Nuggets were in kind of a zone, and the Joker got a little exasperated with that. Did you notice that as well? I didn't notice that, but I have been seeing that people are, I mean, MPJ, he hasn't been shooting the ball. And then people are also 
critical of his defense now. So it's kind of like, what what is he contributing out there? And I think it was smart to give minutes to other guys because, yeah, he's just he's just not performing. And I mean, that's the mark of a great team when a player like MPJ, who's you know their third or fourth best player, can have a dud of a series and. You just have other guys fill in, and they filled in so seamlessly, right. and that's that's why the Nuggets, I think, are are really a championship caliber team. Now, did you play basketball in the high school, college? What did you do? No, it's it's one of my great. My dad always says, like, why didn't you want to play basketball? It's one of kind of my regrets uh, in life is not getting into basketball. I played a little in like a. We had a church league in in my town. All, in all I want to know City. is, uh, have you ever been a good shooter? Have you ever gotten hot? I, I don't have a jump shot. I, I know I can't. I can't play basketball. All right. Well, let me just uh, say another observation that nobody is talking about for MPJ. He's shooting in a little bit of bad luck. One of those critical threes last night was so almost in. It just clanged out barely. You know what I mean? It's not missing far, and I think I'll get it ignited before it keeps going much further. But I want to talk, and I confess this to my rabbi this week, that I think I'm about to start worshiping Nikola Jokic. I've never seen anything like him. Oh, he's a deity. Right, and when we talk about game four, what might or might not happen, you can just predict Nikola's going to have a great game. He's just going to do it. He's steady, rock steady. And uh, that's why we think the Nuggets are going to be champion. But I had Bill Walton on last week talking about his love of Nicola. Spencer Haywood has done it. I want to give you, Connor McCormick Kavanaugh, to tell us the transformative uh, feelings that a Nuggets fan has had covering the Nuggets over the Nicola era. Yeah, I, I remember going to see him. Um... The the Nuggets were playing the Mavericks at it was Pepsi Center back then, and it was Luka Doncic's rookie year. And I was watching; I got to watch Nikola Jokic and Luka Doncic kind of go back and forth, um, you know, scoring one after the other. And then Jokic hit the game winning buzzer beater, and I look back on that as like, wow, I got to see, you know a great player in Luka Doncic, but I got to see one of the greatest of all time players kind of right as he was really starting to break through and people were talking about him like, all right, this guy's going to be all NBA and then eventually he's going to be MVP. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's just a delight to watch. He's, you, you hear all the talking points of like, he doesn't look that athletic and the way he plays yeah, is kind of like Stephen A. Smith called him a tub of lard again, which is, you know, harsh because guys turned into a great athlete. But I don't know, maybe I mean he was kind of a dope boy growing up, but it's a testimony yeah, to hard work. No, he's he gives hope to uh, you know, chubby tall kids who play basketball. And, and he, let's not stop there because I raised two boys and I love basketball and they didn't turn out as tall as me. I used to be six, five and I just played a lot of hoop, but they said, dad, why should we even try? We're white guys. It's like, wh- what do you mean? I, I'm for sure. I, I got to be all city at GW and play small college ball. So like, you know, but Nikola Jokic just proves it, and then Christian Brown on top. It it has nothing to do with race. Yeah, well, I I I think you know generally we're seeing a trend right now of the best white guys in the league are Balkan. So you know Nikola Jokic, uh, Luka Doncic, all the itches. Um, those are generally the best white guys in the league. But yeah, Austin Reeves, you know, Hill Billy yeah. Kobe, and then Christian Brown. Christian Brown, um, you know, can dunk it like Vince Carter. He's got unbelievable hops. And, yeah, it's uh, it's it's and great to see that there's so much like, diversity. And then flex like Steve Atwater. I mean, my God, he's built. <laughs> they, Atwater, say, yep. they say that uh, wives are, are looking at their husbands saying, you're no Christian Braun, and, and, and the husbands <laughs> are looking at Christian Braun saying, well, this guy looks better than you, dear. You know, whatever. He just... <laughs> 
a specimen. But I want to get back to this race and- issue because, you know, I came from that talk radio world where, you know, conservatives won't even really cover the NBA or talk about it because LeBron called Trump a bum. God, was he accurate. So it's stipulated. Anyway, you know what I mean? A lot of people, Mm -hmm. a lot of racists have turned off the NBA and what a loss that is to them. Do you experience that or am I just talking out of my head? No, no. I mean, it's something that I've thought about. Um, I I wonder how much that politics plays a role. Um, I think it's generational also, but how much politics plays a role when we're debating Michael Jordan or LeBron James, who's the greatest of all time. Like, it definitely is a generational thing. I think people who watch Michael Jordan in his prime are more likely to say Michael Jordan. I think people of my generation who grew up on LeBron are more likely to say LeBron. But I do think the politics of Michael Jordan just being wanting to keep politics out of his basketball career, whereas LeBron is much more outspoken about political um, and, and race issues. And yeah, I think it's I think it's turned off some conservatives. It is a it is unfortunate because they're missing out. But I mean, basketball kind of has always been a sport that's like fraught with with questions about race, with questions about politics. Um, you know, you think about 1979, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson are drafted. A lot of white people were like, OK, I'm rooting for the Celtics just because, you know, Larry Bird was the great white hope. So it's it's. It's constantly, you know, in the ethos with the NBA. Right. Bird starring in Boston, which was so racist that Bill Russell wanted to get away afterwards. And he did get as far away as he could to Seattle because they had some bad things happen at his house. I'm old enough to remember Bill Russell playing. And my gosh, he was great center. And you brought up Interesting perspectives. I hadn't thought about the politics of Jordan versus James, but I really think Joker, to use another J, is going to be the GOAT if he keeps this up for another four or five years. And the damn thing about race, and gosh, I think there's a lot of racism out there in the MAGA world, but uh, there's more than enough racism to make it up where it doesn't exist. And Jokic should have won his third straight MVP. And I talked to Bill Walton about it. And maybe it wasn't raised. Maybe it's to protect the legacy of Larry Bird. And who else won it three mm. times? Was it uh, Kareem or well? Anyway, it's a rarefied, other, yeah. rarefied air. And he talked about how Steve Nash got robbed by Dirk Nowitzki. But still, I think people are going to look back and say it was a mistake. Joel Embiid's a nice player sometimes, but he's not Joker. And uh, yeah. and this was I, Joker's best season. And race got mixed up in it when Kendrick Perkins went on ESPN and said, what are they going to give it to a white European guy again? That was ridiculous. Yeah. Kendrick Perkins um, was, yeah, he was kind of... I don't I don't know what he was getting at. It, it wasn't really an accurate comment, but I do think that the he NBA was getting because, at ruining my season long MVP bet on Joker at about twelve to one. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So no, I, I think that the NBA is an entertainment business mm-hmm. and narratives really matter. And I think there was some voter some MVP voter fatigue for for the Joker. And so I think that's a that's a big reason why Joel Embiid won MVP this year. I think Joel Embiid, what bothers me, and I think this bothers Jokic too, is that people, when they're talking about Joker versus Embiid, they tear down the other guy depending on which guy they like more. So you have fans of the 76ers who tear down Joker because they want Embiid to be the best center in the world. And then you have some fans of the Joker who rip on Embiid and say, no, Joker's so much better. Embiid's not that good. When in reality, it's like 1A and 1B. I mean, Joker's going to go down as a better player of all time, but Joel Embiid is such an incredible center. He's a joy to watch. He's he's just such a great basketball player. And and he can also, he can probably defend better than the Joker too. So I I love both of them. And I I love watching the Sixers play. Um, (laughs) They're they're not very good in the playoffs. 
But um, yeah, I mean, I have a dream of one day Embiid coming to the New York Knicks. Okay, you've got that East Coast bias. You've got that New York love. And I love that about you on Twitter. You are so consistent. You live and die with the Mets, the Knicks, and what, the Jets too? Holy cow, you must have. Are you in a full depression all the time, or or how does it go? Uh, Yeah, I mean, being a Mets, Jets, Knicks fan, you you can, there are like two ways of handling it, and I kind of fluctuate between two. You can kind of be constantly down about your teams, or you can kind of laugh at, at the absurdity of it all, at the fact that you're you're rooting for these teams, you're putting so much time into these teams, and they disappoint you so consistently. Um, so well, I, right well, now, yeah, let, yeah. Let's, let's just back up, because this is the time you need to explain yourself. How did you become afflicted with this disease? I'm fourth-generation Denverite. I watched the birth of the Denver Nuggets. I live and die with Denver teams. But what happened to you that made you such a New York fan? So I, I grew up outside of New York City, and um, my dad is, he was right, born and raised in upstate New York. And Tell us um, where, because I have that in my family, too. You, my sure. wife came yeah, from, born... my wife's from Austin. My, her mother came oh, from Austin. the Albany area. Yeah, oh, so okay. use, yeah. Use, use proper names of these towns you're talking about. Sure. So, so my dad was born and raised in Central Valley. It's a small town in Orange County, New York, and uh, it's probably most well known for being where Woodbury Commons, the shopping center, is. And um, so, my dad grew up as kind of a homer of all New York sports teams, r- regardless of you know whether they were in the AL or the NL or the NFC or the AFC or the AFL or the NFL. He was just a fan of all New York sports teams. So he kind of passed that along to me. I was growing up in Pelham, which is in Westchester County outside of New York City. And he passed that along to me. And so I was a fan of the Giants and the Jets. And I was a fan of the Mets and the Yankees. And then as I started to get older, probably late elementary school, early middle school, I started to root for all the teams that my best friend and his brothers rooted for. So they were Jets fans. They were Mets fans. Um, the Knicks is just, that's kind of the basketball team that you root for if you're from New York. But yeah, Jets and Mets were definitely influenced by these kind of, um, these peers of mine. And, you know, it was it was bad luck in some ways, but I've loved it. I, I love rooting for these kind of weird, quirky teams that, that aren't very good because I know, I know that when the Jets win the Super Bowl, for example, in 50 years or the Mets win the world series during my lifetime, it'll be so cathartic and special. And, you know, I might even, I I was telling someone the other day, I was like, if the Jets win the Super Bowl, I'll retire from my sports fandom. Like I'll feel like my, my life of being a sports fan is complete. That's so funny. I wrote a story about Hyman Goldberg, who made the greatest clutch shots ever. It's in my latest Colorado Sun column. Read it. But he came from New York right after Joe Willie had won the Super Bowl. And he was kind of sad coming here. His dad got transferred. And he was a big Jet fan. But if you're a Jet fan, if you're a Knicks fan, I commend you to my... uh, interview of Dan Grunfeld, the son of Ernie Grunfeld, who grew up with his dad as the general manager of the Knicks. And as a boy, he got to be there. And he's a great writer like you are. So you didn't end up being uh, a basketball player. You didn't even play that. Did you play any sports growing up? Uh, Yeah, I I was, um, I got really into football. um, And I played football for a while. What position? um, I I played so when my first position was halfback because I was I was super fast when I was younger and then um, as my speed edge kind of went away I started playing wide receiver uh, defensive back and then my last position that I played was outside linebacker and I was pretty good at that um, and but my best sport actually was lacrosse I was I was pretty good at lacrosse in high school and. Um, I played defense, long pole defense, and um, I, I really, really enjoyed keeping an attack man 
from scoring. I, I think there's something so fun. It's like when you, you know Kawhi Leonard shutting down the best offensive nice. player on an NBA team. That's how I saw it. I wanted to shut down the best attackman on their team and just make his game miserable. Now you, and, met, um, yeah, yeah. I, I bet you were good at it. It's uh, it's similar to basketball, although I've never played lacrosse. Seems dangerous to me. That's why you wear a helmet, right? <laughs> I like a sport without. That's helmets. why you wear a helmet and a cup. Cup but is really I, important. I, I, I do remember. remember a movie involving one of those cities you talked about, Pelham. Pelham one two three. Wasn't Taking that Pelham about one, two, three. it? Was not about the an subway? out of control train? Yeah. 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 So there's. So Pelham is uh, a town just north of the Bronx. And then within the Bronx, just south of Pelham, the town, there's Pelham Bay. And there's, you know, a a golf course called Pelham Bay. And then there's a a subway stop called Pelham Bay. And so um, the taking a Pelham 123 is about the subway that goes to Pelham Bay. And um, yeah, it was out of control. I think some, some crooks hijacked it. Well, I hope your family didn't get hurt. <laughs> no, no. It's we, good because uh, no, I, was... I have a train song this week, so that's what I was going for there. Do you think anything can stop the train the Nuggets are on? My God, it would be one of the worst collapses in sports history now. They have to be overwhelming favorites. Again, what? I haven't looked at the line, six or seven to one. Yeah, they've got to be really heavy favorites. I mean, they they looked so good in – an away game, the first away game of the series. And I looked at the statistics. I saw them in an article. When teams who have home field, home court advantage, since they made the switch to 2 2 1 1 1 of home away, home away, home uh, for the series, they made that switch in 2013, I believe, or 2012. Since that was made, the teams that win, that have home court advantage and win the first two games are. Three and two overall in those series. And one of those was the Lakers in the bubble, and that was neutral venue. So that doesn't really count. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially two and two. Whereas the teams that win one and lose one of having home court advantage are undefeated in that time period since they made the switch. So it's a good omen the way that the series is shaking. Right. Odds are the Nuggets are going to win it all. Right, and we're talking between Game 3 and Game 4, and the only thing that stuns me, I mean, it's historic. Nobody's had, uh, in in NBA history, let alone the playoffs, let alone the finals, nobody's had two guys on the team have triple doubles with over 30 points scored. That's what Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic did. But nobody has been saying what I tweeted. Maybe a few people liked it, but I'm going to say it again. That was the greatest win in Denver Nuggets history. Game three of the finals. And I'd add in so far, but wouldn't you agree that's the biggest win in Nuggets history? Limited knowledge of Colorado that you have? No, 100%. No, it is because the stakes are so high. You're coming off a loss. You lost your home court advantage. And you, it's, I was telling friends, they thought I was joking, but I was like, this is a must win for the Nuggets. They have to win this game. It's it's so important for momentum. And the way they just came out and pretty much dominated the Heat. They were just, they could get anything they wanted. It was the biggest win in Nuggets history. It, it may not have been the, the craziest or the most entertaining, but in terms of stakes, and the stage, yeah, definitely it's the biggest one. But it is, so far. no, it could have been closer. I'm glad it wasn't, but it was entertaining. And people who don't think Nicola is entertaining or the Nuggets are boring, they just haven't watched. And to keep kind of track of triple doubles, of course, I'm wagering, but I think I'd be interested regardless. Are you kidding me? Two guys with triple doubles. And you kind of watch that, the game within the game. And I don't know of any more entertaining team sports product than the Denver Nuggets. Do you? No, the Nuggets are great to watch. If Whether, you, whether you're a basketball nut like you and I are, or you're someone who is kind of sitting down, you're a casual fan, you can still appreciate the aesthetics and the impressiveness of what Jokic is doing because 
it's just incredible to watch. And so I think casuals who give it a shot, it may not have the same narratives as a LeBron being in the finals or the San Antonio Spurs being in the finals, but it is just really compelling television. And so, yeah, I, I, I try and tell people like, Hey, you got to watch Jokic sometime, even if you're a casual, you got to watch him because he's going to go down as one of the all time greats. And he's yes. so fun to watch. Yes. Did you see game two when the Serbian announcers were shown on the screen and they waved? Mm -hmm. I met those guys last Friday night at a Mares place, DNBR bar. And God, did they have basketball knowledge? I didn't know they were big shots like that. What do I know about Serbian TV? Until there they were on the screens. And they, of course, worship Jokic, but these guys know the minutia of the NBA. I told them my freshman year, I went back east. I had enough of it in one year, Connor, but I played at a school called Uppsala with Coach Richie Adubato and his assistant, Ron Rothstein. And these guys came alive because both of them went on to have NBA head coaching jobs, you know, way back when. But they knew my old coaches because they study it. And when Anamara said, I don't know if I've really seen Bill Walton in action because he's young like you, these guys said, oh, no, they posted those series at NBA.com. You can watch it all. And they had, you know what I mean? So... Uh, how how big of a basketball freak are you now? I'm huge. I, I've been I've been a huge basketball freak since probably my freshman year of high school when I was watching every single Knicks game when they were terrible. And uh, I'm a huge fan. What What's interesting? I don't know if you've heard the Ringer did this great kind of a. It was like a long form journalism podcast where they set out to investigate why. Balkans and people from the former Yugoslavia are so good at basketball. And it's, it's a great, great piece. Um, they, they travel to Serbia, they travel around the Balkans and they're interviewing all these different people. But one, one thing that separates Balkan basketball players from American basketball players or other European basketball players is that they are not getting boxed into one position when they're practicing. So they're not so Jokic when he was practicing as a kid he was not practicing as a big man every single play. That's why he can play point guard 2 3 4 5 all the positions because they they learn how to handle the ball. They learn how to post up. They learn how to play the wing. So they learn every position and then they can, you know, play every position. And so that's that's something that's really unique in the the Balkan school of basketball. Can I throw in a New York Knicks story along those lines? Oh, yeah. I already bragged about being first-team All-City, unanimous, my senior year, 1974. And I beat out wow. a guy named Michael Ray Richardson, who played at Manuel, who also played forward. He was 6'5", like me, but he was kind of in the wrong position. And when he got to Montana, a coach named Jim Brandenburg said, you're fast. Why don't we let you dribble? Oh, you can dribble and you can go. Then he got drafted by the Knicks. Then he was rookie of the year. Then he was an all-star. Wow. And then he fell victim to cocaine. And you know who made a documentary about Michael Ray Richardson? Did Spike Lake? Adam Silver, when he's a young lawyer oh. trying to make it in the NBA. And he got Chris Rock to narrate it. Whatever happened wow. to Michael Ray? It's all about this kid from Denver, Park Hill. He went to Georgia, just like Chauncey Billups, much later. No, he didn't go to Georgia, excuse me. He went to Manuel, unlike uh, Chauncey. Anyway, Michael Ray Richardson. And you know what they called him in New York back then? This before you were born. Instead of what Michael Ray, Sugar Ray. Sugar Ray Richardson. Ah, uh, yeah. If you had Ray in your name back then, you were called Sugar Ray. And then he ended That's up coaching uh, some pro team in upstate New York. Again, apropos of your family and your heritage. And then he got in some trouble. You can look this up for an anti-Semitic comment. But he was talking about Jewish lawyers or this or that. And I think he was talking about Harvey Steinberg because Harvey had represented him. Anyway, 
It's a long, complicated story. Maybe he was talking about somebody else, but it's a small world. And you bring up the New York wow. Knicks. Yeah, I got I to gotta watch that. That sounds really good. And you know why my old man liked the Knicks? Because their coach, Red Holtzman, and then the Jewish heritage of the New York Knicks is amazing. I'm going to send you that book and you can read about it. I don't think with your name, Connor McCormick Kavanaugh, it's kind of a Jewish name, but I'm guessing Irish. <laughs> Irish. Irish, definitely. I'm Irish, Lebanese, and Croatian. Oh, how Not- cool is that? I interrupted yeah. you when you were talking about how these guys got great, but I kind of know a little because Adam Mares, the DNBR bar guy, he made a documentary called A Hundred Invisible Threads when he went over there in search of Nicola's greatness. And I know one of the clues, and you can go back to your story, they grow them really tall there, right? People are super they're, tall. They're just tall. I mean, that's such an advantage. Um so, so the, it's a it's a a handful of different factors why they're so good. It's the idea that they play all these different positions, so they're essentially like a Renaissance man on the mm-hmm. court. They are naturally tall, and then they have this cultural theme. That's uh, it's it's this word. It's called enat, and it's hard to directly translate it to English, but it's shared by all the Balkan countries. It's kind of like you know, I'll, I'll just, I got nothing to lose. I'll prove them wrong is essentially what it translates to. So it's kind of like, screw it. I'll, I'll, I'll succeed anyway, in spite of them. And, you know, it, it, it it's kind of, it, it fits in with the themes of the Balkans. It's, it's a part of the world that has, you know, been, been a keg of Europe and has had wars um, over the decades and centuries. And so they're kind of still there thriving despite it all. And that's, it's kind of trickled down to the basketball players. If I recall correctly, the last people to really put a bombing on them was NATO, right? As part of the Serbia-Kosovo yep. conflict. So Kosovo. most mm-hmm. Serbians really don't like NATO and therefore probably are a little more conflicted than I am about the Ukraine war, where I think Putin is the scum of the earth. And they think, well, maybe, but NATO is too. I, I think yeah. that's the attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know exactly, but that that would make sense. I, I bet they have a really kind of conflicted view of NATO because of the history between NATO and and Serbia. Right, but uh, yeah, and Nikola Jokic. I hope he stays out of politics until he's done with basketball. Then he can be the leader of the world, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know I what don't he think does? He has any interest in politics, I know, I like know. even after. But this guy has fed me and my family with those double-double deals at Wendy's. I just got one before this podcast. For a while there, anytime he had a double-double or any nugget, you could get a free uh, double-double at Wendy's the next day if you bought one. So why not have two? I can eat that much. Anyway... (laughs) <laughs> if this guy put he made me a tub of lard. I'm trying to work it off now. You know, they did it so much, they had to change it to chicken nuggets. And I, who wants those, you know, little stale things? Anyway. I mean, the guy averages a triple-double. You can't, yeah, you can't come up with a deal that's a double-double. You'll go out of business. And you somehow resisted going there all the time like I did. But, you know, who's <laughs> this? I ranked the top nuggets the other day, and Joker was at the top of the list. And uh, I put Dan Issel up there, and I put David Thompson, and I put Alex English, and then I put Carmelo Anthony in my top five. My column was about missing my dad and my brother, and before my dad departed this mortal coil, what, 12 years ago, we would watch Carmelo, and my dad did not like the way Carmelo played. He was selfish with the ball, with the Nuggets, and then he wanted to go to New York because it's so much better there, just like Connor wanted to go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have roots there, but you know what I mean? And there are hard yeah. feelings, and among your last articles for Westward, you're advocating that Carmelo be welcomed back with open arms. George Carl, who kind of brutalized Carmelo in his book, on Twitter, he feels the same way. But I'm thinking about my dad and my late brother. And we were kind of united in not liking Carmelo's game or his disrespect of Denver 
Go ahead, make your case for your New York Knicks hero. <laughs> he's he's why the main reason why I developed a soft spot for Carmelo is because my dad went to Syracuse, so I grew up a fan of Syracuse mm-hmm. basketball and Jim Beheim, and so Carmelo was such a great player in in that season when they won the national championship in 03. And I think if you watch him in college, if you watch him on the Nuggets, if you watch him on the Knicks, and even later in his career, the reason why he no, played no, the way I he did. Can I just say why I love him a little? The, the, way he sure. played, the way he played in the Olympics? Keep going. He's, he's, yeah, he's the greatest Olympic basketball player of all time. And but no, it, because he's so good at scoring. He's so good. He he really, in his prime, he had the best one-on-one offensive game in the NBA. He could score every which way. He was a great shooter. He could post you up. Um, he could deke you out. He could step back and hit a fadeaway mid-range shot. He was just so, so good. And so I think that's part of it. Is It's, you know, it's like with, other players like LeBron is not going to try and score as much as a Carmelo every night, but that's because LeBron, his, his specialty isn't necessarily scoring. It's everything. Whereas Carmelo, his specialty was scoring. Right. But, I think- but why not adapt? Okay. I'm old enough to remember like LeBron, he has a lot more assists as he gets older. James Harden can do it. Going way back to the ABA, and you may remember this name, Rick Barry. Guy led the league in scoring. He could score over 30 in his sleep, but he got in his 30s, and he started leading the NBA in assists. Why not Carmelo? He never could really pass the ball because, and I'm not uh, I'm not casting stones because I never really passed that much either. So I get it. He was, but, he was such a great shooter, though. So I, I think that has something to do with it. But yeah, no, I... I get what you're saying. He wasn't he wasn't a facilitator. That wasn't really part of his his game. And maybe it is a, a weakness in, in his in his game overall. But um, what about his disrespect of Denver? You know we have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder. Tell us when you got sure. to Colorado. When did you get here? Why did you come here? How long did you stay? And do you still love us? Because we care about those guys. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So I I uh, moved there in, in 2018 and I stayed for five years. Um, I moved for the job at Westward and, um, I, I had some buddies who were living in Denver and they had really good things to say. So, um, that was part of picking the city and yeah, I, I, I fell in love with it. Um, it's, it's a great city. It's got great people. I think it's got people who are, um, very friendly and unpretentious they're they're down to earth and and that's something that is really important to me and spending time with people I, I want them to be down to earth and yeah it's a great place um i moved for you know family circumstances because my fiance got um she's doing her medical residency here in new york um and so that that was kind of what drew me away but i i considered myself i used to joke to people that I consider myself like a mellow lobbyist in in Denver or like a mellow diplomat. I consider myself like Jimmy Carter, you know, trying to bring together Egypt and Israel. I I really wanted to get people to have a positive view of Carmelo Anthony. But you did did you follow it? Did you read up on the disrespect? Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, I when all this was happening in 2010 and 2011, I was on the other side of it. I was an I was a Knicks fan who was super excited to have Carmelo Anthony, who incredible player, the star that the Knicks were looking for, went to Syracuse, born in Brooklyn, and you know lived there until he was eight. So he's coming home. But once I learned about it from the Denver perspective, I totally understood why people felt kind of like jilted lovers because they had loved Carmelo so much. And then he just said, you know, I I don't want to stay in Denver. He never, he never really like, he he never said anything where he was trashing the Mile High City. 
Well, he got married. But, he got married to a super MTV whatever, and yep. then he, she a wanted. New Yorker. She didn't like and Denver, s- right? So we, yeah, so that that changed his uh, mentality. Probably he became someone who you know saw the lights and and the glamour and wanted to do that. Um, it probably worked out for him, but I need to push back because I am an attorney on him being the best Olympics player. He played in a lot of Olympics. He scored a lot, but for one single Olympics, my guest Spencer Haywood, nineteen sixty eight. As an 18 year old, back when pros kind of play. Wow. And uh, Lou Alexander turned him down. Oh my God. And they won big. They beat Yugoslavia in the gold medal game because the Russians got knocked out by Yugoslavia, apropos of us talking about the Balkans uh-huh. and great basketball. Okay. Now, here's the thing on the top five list, there's somebody that we left out. Yet you wrote about him, the most enduring superstar the Nuggets ever had. You know who I'm talking about. And looks like you're still working for Westwood. What was the date on it? May 31st? You know who I'm talking about. The best part of going down to see the Nuggets for years oh. was Rocky. Rocky. Rocky has yes. to be the best NBA mascot. Now, I'm a homer, but I've never seen a guy make a higher percentage of backwards half-court shots but you wrote about him. I'm going to link it with your permission on my show notes. Tell Please us, say, yeah. tell us about your Rocky scoop. It's a scoop, isn't it? It's a scoop. Yeah, I got a couple scoops about Rocky over the years. Um, a, a few years back, so this guy Ken Solomon, um, he started as Rocky in 1990. He auditioned to be Rocky, and um, he had gone to college. Um, he was a mascot in college. He was an acrobat in college. And so he was kind of a natural future NBA mascot. Right. He 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 took over for a prior Rocky, right? No. So he was the first Rocky. He was the first Rocky. Okay. So the way they did it is the Nuggets had all these people who were trying out to be Rocky audition in gorilla suits. And so he was auditioning in a gorilla suit and he just blew it out of the water. And so they hired him as Rocky. And since then, he's become kind of the super mascot of the NBA. He's he's got he's a great athlete. He's a great acrobat. He's got great energy. He's got a great sense of humor. And he's an incredible backwards half court shooter, kind of an uncanny, uncannily good backwards half court shooter. Add all of that together with his incredible energy level like he doesn't tire during a game that's what makes him the best mascot in the nba and that's why he's been in the suit for so long now the scoop was that a couple years ago ken quietly retired from the suit of rocky and passed along the suit to his real life son now he's got a few sons one of them was kind of one of those halftime dunkers at Nuggets games. They dunk on trampolines. They right. do kind of all those crazy moves. So it was he who filled the suit. There's a second son who's the minder of Rocky. He, he, he takes him around at games, make sure he is where he, he's supposed to be. And then there's a third son who is Hooper, the Detroit Pistons mascot. Wow. So it's a family affair. And... So the son had been in the suit for the last couple of years and he, he was, he was good, but what he struggled with was the backwards half court shot. Like he, he couldn't buy a bucket from the backwards half court range and people really noticed and he didn't have, no one can really replicate Ken's energy level. So he didn't quite have that being on all the time. And so then so I got that scoop that there had been that kind of quiet transition. The Nuggets and Cronky Sports and Entertainment won't talk about it. It's like it's it's like some huge state secret. They won't talk about who's inside the suit at all. But then this season, the son ended up having a medical issue, um, needed to take a break, went on the mascot, injured reserve, and Ken step back into the suit. And so it's Ken right now 
in his first ever NBA Finals, um, and he might be on the court game five if if the Nuggets can seal the deal, win win all these games in a row. He'll be on the court for a championship. Oh my God, what a story! And how did yeah, he do in great. game one and game two? Do you know? Did he make the back? Uh, shot? Yeah, there's some people who track him. I think he might have hit one of his first shots nice. in one of those games. He hit one of his first backwards half court shots. Um, you know what? And it, it, one of the coolest parts of having to steal the feed since uh, Cronky and Comcast can never work it out. I found all sorts of ways to find the live feed. Other people did. I'm not going to miss my nuggets. But you got to watch Rocky shoot, which was tremendous. hundred percent. Right? Yeah. No, it's it's incredible. Once you, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, th- the fact that there's a dispute between Altitude and Comcast or any TV network, fans should still find ways to watch the team play. So do yeah. whatever you need to to watch the team play. And yes, the huge benefit of watching the team play through um, it's it's essentially I think it's like the NBA TV. No, that's stream. like uh, the sites are like six stream, meth stream, crack stream. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got I got recruited to be a terrorist while I was on there, but what the <laughs> heck? I got to watch basketball. I'm I'm now but you part can of watch, a, you can, I, right. I'm part of uh, Rumble and uh, Telegram. No, I'm just kidding. But the, <laughs> you, you have to no, keep you can clicking. Watch, you can yes. watch the in between. It's it's yes. cool. You can watch what the fans see. Normally, yes. uh, when we go to commercial break during games, we get to see now what they're seeing at the games. And so, yeah, I and the Nuggets dancers. I don't know long before you got here. What were you doing in two thousand two? Were you in school or were you a baby? Two, I was in elementary school. All right. Well, Ken got arrested. I don't know if you ever heard about it. It was in the paper. Yeah. I love Ken. And he got represented by Harvey Steinberg, who I've known forever. He's come up twice in this podcast, Small World. I don't think he was convicted, but it was quite a thing. And he was 36 back in 2002, add on 21 years the guy's 57. This is a bigger story than Tom Brady. My God. I know. I know. And he's in he's in insanely good shape. Insanely good shape. Like, it's it's incredible. And it sounds like his family is totally together. I don't know if his wife's still there, but his sons love him if they're emulating him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like the flying uh, wall enders in a way. I mean, it's an amazing tradition. So keep going. So... How do you get these scoops? So you're in New York and you're beating everybody else on really the Nuggets' biggest star before Joker, Rocky. <laughs> well, that one, that one, I, I, uh, I came out of uh, Westward retirement to to write that story just because um, I have I have some insider knowledge on it all. And is that is that a, is that a pun when you say insider? You know who's in the mountain lion costume? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, but no, I I, I know. Um, I, I just Patty Patty Calhoun and I yes. were talking, and we're like, "Yeah, this is let's get one of these articles out just before the final start. It would be perfect." And uh, yeah, people people really like the article, and I had written obviously other ones about Rocky before and who's inside the suit. Um, But the timing was just too good. So I had to do it. I know it. I think I'd give my, you know, I'd give a body part to interview Ken Solomon because I really admire him. I have seen his energy level and I don't know how anybody could keep up with that. I sort of feel sorry for his sons and his sense of humor is impeccable. And this isn't just me, the Homer, talking. This is pretty much nationally regarded as true. Rocky, the mascot, is the best there ever was in the NBA. Am I right? Yeah. No, I, I'd say I'd say he's he's the best there ever was. I mean, I hope we're not engaging in any recency bias but if i'm just racking my brain for the top mascots in the nba i i'd say he is i don't think the nba overall is as strong 
in the mascot business as baseball is. Oh, no, you're not going to bring up that Mets guy, are you? No, no. I mean, Mr. Mets. Yeah, (laughs) Mr. Mets, great. I mean, he's classic, but no, I mean, there's some great mascots. Yeah, in, and it doesn't baseball, include like Dinger. Philly fanatic. Yeah, not Dinger. That's I like true. Dinger, but yeah, people people don't love Dinger. I um, watch Tim Bourne just like the Nuggets. But well, you put, uh, I, I think egg. Ken Solomon's your friend, and I'd like him on this show. Has he ever given an interview, or is he like Marcel Marceau? It would just break the he, wall. He has a podcast oh. that he does a YouTube podcast and you should check it out in character um, in costume outside of costume oh. just ken solomon I think show or something like that uh google ken solomon podcast yeah, i think it's uh something inside the fur or something the fur and look that up he talks he, he describes himself as a former NBA mascot, I think, or a former sports mascot. And he interviews former mascots and they kind of just talk about what the business is like, what it was like being a mascot. And obviously right now he's no longer former. He's current mascot. But yeah, he... Between the fur. He, Ken Solomon. Ken with two N's in, Solom- uh, in Ken. K-E-N-N. And is, he's on Twitter at SuperKen1. With two ends at the end. Thanks for that. I will start listening. For sure. Okay, so... Give him a listen. I will. Now we're talking podcasts. And you cover the media. And Westward was a big part of the media. This is back to part of your exit interview. And that is... uh, How is Colorado media? It's kind of hurting right now, isn't it? I'd say... Colorado media is really strong in a lot of ways. There's there's a lot of great journalists and reporters doing work um, on TV, on the radio, and on and in print and in online publications. Um, I, I think there's like a really robust ecosystem of reporters. I'm going to take uh, back I, the way I phrased the question. I want to be more neutral because I take pride in Colorado media. I just go back to when we had the Post and the news, but I am thinking about a lot of great podcasts. Like I mentioned, DNBR, I listen to them, new ways of doing things. And I work with the Colorado Sun, which is great. So I just wanted to retract my stupid beginning. So keep going. No, no, I don't think it was. I don't think it was stupid beginning. I think it's a mix in that there's this great ecosystem of journalists and reporters, but obviously the newspaper business is not what it used to be. And so the post. I mean, the Rocky doesn't exist. The post is much smaller than it used to be, and that's partially attributable to hedge fund ownership, but then also just newspaper business, not what it once was. And then, you know, Westward used to be, used to have a a, a pretty sizable newsroom and now it's much smaller than it used to be. So I think journalists are having to do more with a lot less and um, they're being asked to do more. And I think they're stepping up, but yeah, I mean, there's not as many eyes overall looking over everything in, in Colorado politics, but especially um, on the local level. I mean, there used to be a, a ton of a ton of reporters who would go to be in City Hall every day, Monday through Friday. And now, you know, each publication has maybe one there and not all the time necessarily. So, yeah, it's it, it, it's struggling in some ways, too. Right, and that hurts us in a lot of ways. But I want to find out about you. When you came here, what was your job? And was it enough? I, because to me, you covered everything. We will get around to city politics and the mayoral election, all of that. But you covered such a wide array of things. I don't know if that was your original assignment. And it seems to me you ended up being one of those overworked people. And I imagine you were underpaid given the quality of your work and the hours into it. Am I right? Yeah. So um, I came there and I essentially started out as like a general 
reporter, general assignment reporter at Westward. And then I developed beats kind of, some of them were just, you kind of stumble into beats and then other ones you're like, Oh, you write about this once and you're really interested in it. Rank your your top five beats. So my favorite beat, and I think my most impactful beat was my reporting on homelessness. And um, I just loved reporting on that. And I think it's super important. I, I would say housing, um, city politics, zoning. I mean, that might sound weird, but zoning, I think, is really important. And then I liked reporting on sports betting and mushrooms. So I guess I gave you six, but uh, those were my kind of probably top six. I think you would have been a tough candidate to beat for mayor if you like all those issues, because that kind of (laughs) encompassed it. You ended up being the guy covering the mayoral race. I had both Kelly Brupp and Mike Johnston on twice. Got to know them a lot better. You followed them around during your last months in Colorado. Tell us about that experience and what you thought of Mike Johnston being elected on Tuesday night. Yeah, so uh, it's funny. I look back. um, I went to this press conference in the run-up to the November 2020 to election, the statewide election. Mike Johnson, he's working for uh, a large philanthropic group, Gary Community Investments, I think is mm-hmm. the name of it, or Gary Community Ventures. And they had, they have, and they had a ton of money. So they've been, you know, pushing various policy issues. And so they pushed um, a, a ballot measure to increase Colorado's affordable housing stock. And I remember going to a press conference for that. And in the run-up to the November 2022 election, and Mike Johnson was wearing a Colorado flag belt buckle and cowboy boots. And I had heard his name, you know, thrown around as, okay, this guy is running for mayor. So I asked him, Mike, um, I waited until the press conference was over. I went up to him and I said, Mike, are you running for mayor? And he said, I'm focused on this right now, referring to the the ballot measure. And I said, okay, are you thinking about running for mayor? And he said, again, it's a classic politician response. I'm focused on this right now. I was like, all right, okay. But I thought about it and I was like, okay, he is wearing the uniform of kind of like a stereotypical Denver mayor candidate. He was wearing Colorado flag belt buckle and cowboy boots. And so he was kind of giving it away that he was running for mayor then. But yeah. And then, I always you know, find that an declared. interesting question, though. Are you thinking about it? Like, what are you, the thought police? And if you're asking him the question, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about it right now since you asked me. Of course, I'm thinking about it. I, I don't <laughs> no, know. No, I, I mean, he... It was it was annoying for me as a reporter for him not to answer directly when he clearly was planning on running for mayor. But I get why he didn't say that. He didn't want to take away any attention from the ballot measure. Did you ever did you ever bust him on that? Hey, do you remember when I figured it out that you were running for mayor? No, no, I I I definitely should have, though. Um, We could have had a chuckle about that. So did you see this result coming? I did. I did. Um, I, when I was thinking about who was going to win in the first round, I thought it was going to be him as the the number one. And then I thought it was either going to be Kelly or Lisa. I actually predicted that it was going to be Mike and Lisa um, with Kelly a close third. Um, Turned out it was Mike and Kelly Bruff, obviously. And um, Lisa, Lisa ran a really strong campaign. She, she got really close to getting in the runoff. And I would have been curious to see what would have happened if it had been Mike and Lisa. But, um, and then Mike uh, and Kelly in the runoff, I predicted that Mike was going to win. I kind of, I saw the momentum of his campaign build and build and build in the lead up to the first round. And then throughout the, the lead up to the runoff, to the runoff election. And, he just 
people will criticize him. And I think Kelly's campaign tried to criticize him for being backed by big money donors and a ton of money. Well, yes. I mean, that's that's a fair critique. And big money in politics frustrates a lot of people, including myself. But Mike also ran a really, really strong campaign because he focused his messaging almost entirely on two things. He focused it on solving homelessness and increasing the housing stock in the city of Denver. And those are the two biggest issues on the minds of Denverites right now. And and Mike just nailed it. He didn't, he he, he picked that as, as his two issues right from the start. And then he stuck to that. And he was very, very consistent, very compelling in his messaging and very ambitious and essentially saying, let's shoot for the moon. Right, and with these micro houses. He describes it well on my episode 134, but you are an expert on this. It's number one on your beat. Will his micro housing plan work for Denver? I think there have been positive results from micro housing and, and tiny homes. Um, we've seen positive results in Denver in the, in the limited um, amount that it's been done in the city. I think he, so I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that he'll succeed in this, in, in, in reaching his ambitions. Now, I think he's swimming upstream to an extent because he's operating as the chief executive of the city and county of Denver, but he's also within a state that has homelessness and housing issues across the state. So he can solve various elements of that in Denver, but that won't have quite the widespread impact that one would want. But the even bigger issue is that he's doing it in a country where homelessness is a massive issue. Housing is a massive issue. The cost of housing is a massive issue. And it's not going to get better overnight. And it's not going to get better probably for decades. I mean, just the way that this country has gone and the disinvestments that have been made in certain areas. So it's going to be tough to solve it alone as the city and county of Denver because, um, yeah, he's just swimming upstream in that regard. But I, I hope, I hope I'm, uh, I hope I'm just being jaded. I hope he can prove people wrong. I think there are big changes coming. And there will be better solutions. AI will help with it because uh, I think we're on the cusp of conceiving things never before thought. And Mike Johnston is smart enough to get that probably a lot better than me. And we could go off on that tangent. But I just want to know, first of all, I saw Hamilton in New York and I loved it. And there's a song nice. in there where the king sings. Do you know the score? Do you know the soundtrack? Uh, very little well, of it. Well, you'd be King songs. George saying you'll be back. I'm saying you'll be back to Colorado. You'll make your wife move <laughs> back here. Did the Denver teams, did they become your second favorite? Do you now root for the Broncos, the Nuggets, even as your first faves are all these New York teams? Definitely. The Nuggets are... are one of my favorite teams like they they're very i i love the nuggets i fell in love with them all well, the broncos i, I root you go ahead oh well i was just gonna say the broncos i root for but um i don't know the broncos didn't hook me in quite in the same way um i think it, it, it it's difficult the broncos and the jets both being in the afc uh whereas the nuggets and the knicks are in different conferences um and the Rockies, I, I, I like the Rockies a lot. It, it, it's very frustrating to, to watch uh, how the franchise is. They, not don't, even, they don't even have a great mascot. <laughs> I like that. But, but, but just to show you that Denver's better than New York, because after the Jets won that Super Bowl, they played in Mile High the next year. And I was there when. Dave Cost had number 63, sealed our victory over the world champion Jets 
by just nailing Joe Namath right in the sternum. Wow. I watched that. Wow. That's how old I friggin' am. But <laughs> I also have this, you know, little cow town chip on our shoulder. Don't you think Denver's a pretty damn good city? And all these people who say Denver's in total decay and it's not safe to go downtown. I went on the light rail at about, uh, I don't know, about 8 o'clock the other night. And I went downtown to Union Station, checked out the Johnston Victory Celebration, took the light rail back about midnight. I wasn't worried, you know. Come on. Denver's still a relatively safe place. I, I think the problems of the Mile High City are exaggerated by people who just haven't been downtown in a while. Am I right? Yeah, I agree. I think I think Denver definitely has its issues. Um, like a lot of big cities across the U.S. right now, it's, it's struggling in a number of ways. Um, but... I, I think people exaggerate a lot, especially people who don't actually live inside Denver. I mean, I lived in Denver, um, you know, I, the, I lived for three years most recently in Uptown. And so I was walking or biking to and from the Westward office in my apartment every single day. And then, you know, I'd walk to the ballpark neighborhood. I would walk downtown. Um, and it, it's, I don't know. It's just, it's just a city. It's if, if you've lived in a city before, you're kind of used to what city life is like. It's not always pretty. Um, but, but yeah, I, 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 I don't think Denver is in decay. I just think it's, it's going through, you know, some kind of some growing pains that a lot of cities are going through right now. Some of them are pandemic um, kind of affected or influenced, but yeah, ho- homelessness is a big issue. Drug use and drug addiction obviously is a big issue. And the lack of affordable housing is a big issue. I think car theft is is a very frustrating yeah. issue in Denver and Colorado. And um yeah, there there's some there's some big issues to dig into, but it's still a lovely city. It's a really special American city. I could not agree more. And you graced our city. We really miss you. Keep following you on Twitter. Tell people how they can follow you. And you said you were leaving Westward, but that Rocky article, you write back in with this scoop of the NBA finals, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I know. it's uh, uh, What is it? Michael Corleone quote, just as I get out, coming <laughs> right back in. That's the yeah, thing about uh, Colorado. We're going to drag you right back here, especially with that smoke there. You you must be one to be in Colorado today. I know. The smoke here, it, it, it followed me from Colorado to New York. But um, no, yeah, people can follow me at ConnorMichael28 on Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, right now, it's heavy, heavy nuggets focus on, on the Twitter sphere. Um, and then after that, It'll probably be depressed and that's tweets once the Nuggets season is over. Well, I bet you'll get back to writing. Are you looking for a gig like that or what are you doing? Being a house husband or what? <laughs> yeah, I guess technically I'm a house husband. No, I'm, I'm looking for um, a writing gig right now. Um, I have some good leads and hopefully something will come to fruition in the near future. But um, yeah, I just I just love you know, writing and being creative. So I want to keep doing that for as long as I can. Well, you are excellent at it. We will throw in the links. I really appreciate all your time. And there's only one good way to end this podcast. Let's go Nuggets. Go Nuggets. Let's go Nuggets. Let's go Nuggets. All Thanks right. a lot, Craig. Thank you. It was a pleasure. See you, Connor. It was a pleasure. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Michael, of course, is a great sponsor of my show, but more than that, he's my lawyer, my end-of-life planning lawyer, and I've got two dogs. What about you? I have two dogs right now as well. And not only do you love your dogs at home with your kids and your wife, but you get involved with dog issues in your law practice. Tell everybody about that. So I will write pet trusts, which is you can earmark 
money to take care of your pets. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they've got their dogs and you know, they love their dogs. But then if somebody were to, you know, if, you're, if you were to pass away, you know, who's going to take your dogs? Who would, who would love your dogs as much as you do? I don't know that anybody would love your dogs as much as you do. But, like, I grew up with dogs. And so if I were to pass away, then my parents or my siblings could take the dogs. So when you set up a pet trust, you can dictate who's going to get those dogs and then who you can leave money to take care of the dogs as well. I like working with you and I think you are ahead of your time. You have 15 different locations. How cool is that? It's, it is nice to be able to go to all the different locations and you know meet people where it's comfortable and more convenient for them. And nobody wants to drive from one part of Metro Denver to the other to meet with a lawyer. You will come to them. Yep. And I'll deal with traffic so you don't have to. Tell us how people can get in touch with you. My direct phone number is 720-394-6887. Or they can go to my website, which is mobileestateplanning.com. And again, that's mobileestateplanning.com. And there's even a schedule, you know, there's a book an appointment link on this on the website. All right, Michael Bailey. Thank you. Okay, here's the thing. You've been hurt. Maybe, God forbid, someone's been killed. You don't know what to do. If it happened in Colorado, please get a hold of me. Check out my website, craigscoloradolaw.com. Craigscoloradolaw.com because I have four decades of experience. Sadly, I've helped a lot of people who have been hurt terribly through no fault of their own. 303-734-7156. Please call Craig. Craig Silverman, a voice for victims. 303-734-7156. Wow, I told you this would be a great show. I felt the energy. How about you? Gosh, Game 4 was great. I like fresh podcasts. I hope you do, too. Please tell a friend about our troubadour. You know, you can go online, Dave Gunder's music, Amazon Music, Apple, YouTube. He is just terrific. This song we played this week, it's not up yet, but it will be. You can hear it on my podcast. Tell a friend. Dave Gunders is so smart. And the thing I love, everybody's into the Nuggets now. I've been into the Nuggets and the Rockets forever, and it's beautiful to see Denver as the mecca of basketball. I just love that. Loved having Connor McCormick Kavanaugh as a guest. Episode 152 was a doozy. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening. Tune in live every Saturday morning, 9 to noon, Mountain Time. Visit the CraigSilvermanShow.com for the podcast, blog, and more. Be sure to subscribe on all major podcasting platforms to be updated when new episodes are available. This has been The Craig Silverman Show. <laughs>